Between 1885 and 1887, a group of 45 Catholic and Anglican Ugandans were executed by the king of Buganda, Kabaka Mwanga II. Now the story goes that these young Christian men were killed because they refused the sexual advances of the king. At the time in Buganda, which is modern-day Uganda, there were three factions vying for influence in Mwanga's courts, Catholics, Anglicans, and Muslims. Sex with court pages was a common practice, and it included both male and female pages. Dr. Kenneth Hamilton from Notre Dame de Namur University points out that, for the boys at least, being a page at the royal court was an envious position because they were seen as the future leaders of the kingdom. Mwanga kills a lot of pages, both Christian and Muslim, and there were political factors involved with that. But what's interesting for our discussion is how this event impacts Ugandan identity and opinions on sexuality. This becomes a pivotal event and it grows in influence. Eventually, the pages are venerated as martyrs and become canonized as saints in 1964. These pilgrimages to the Basilica of the Ugandan Martyrs, there's a university named after them, and their feast day, June 3rd, is a public holiday in Uganda. And this story has an important role in Africanized Christianity across East Africa and even on the other side of the continent in Senegal. But the role that sexuality plays in this story evolves over time. John Blevins of Emory University writes that the earliest accounts of this story didn't include the sex bit. Even when they're canonized in the 1960s, the Pope doesn't really mention sex. Kevin Ward, African Studies lecturer at the University of Leeds, says that at the time of Ugandan independence, Mwanga was characterized as an African patriot. And throughout the 70s and 80s, Ward would hear his students speak about Mwanga with more sympathy as someone who opposed colonial powers. It's not until the 1990s that sexual behavior and identity become a larger part of this narrative, and Kabaka Mwanga becomes depicted as a homosexual predator and pedophile. This, even though he had multiple wives and children, so he's at least bisexual if we have to put a label on him, and the pages he killed were either close to his own age or some were older than him, so pedophile doesn't fit either. Why the shift in attitude? Again, it's connected with colonialism. The West moves towards a particular understanding of sexual identity and orientation, and we impose that perspective in our cultural exports, and we enforce it politically in our fight for LGBTQ rights, and that produces a culture clash. We can see a massive colonial Western influence in this Ugandan a martyr's story. It gets refamed as a St. Pelagius story. It's interesting to note that there is a story of a young saint, uh, Pelagius, who was a Christian in Spain and captured by the Moors. He gets executed when he refuses the caliph's sexual advances, very similar to the Ugandan story. I imagine that as European missionaries retell this Ugandan event, that St. Pelagius gets mixed up into it. We might be tempted to say, Oh, hey, Uganda, are bad. When we occupied your country, we left behind a bit of our homophobia. I'll just take that from you now and toss it out. But if we do that, we're just repeating the mistakes of colonialism, imposing our views on another culture. I love more Togorasi and Enzra Chidando, professors from Botswana and Zimbabwe, respectively, talk about how tricky this is. They recognize that a lot of the negative attitudes towards queer and trans people in Africa was left behind by colonialism. But for a Western power to now march in and demand queer rights is also problematic. They write, It is our opinion that as long as there is a perception that Africa is being civilized or talked down to to accept same-sex sexuality, it will remain extremely difficult to make headway in changing attitudes towards same-sex relationships. This is work that African researchers, scholars, and the people themselves need to do. We can be supportive, but we have to be very careful to listen and to take our cues from African LGBTQ activists themselves. 
And we need to be aware that the ways that African communities talk about sexuality, the methods they use to bring about inclusion of LGBTQ people, and what the end result looks like, might be very different than it looks here in North America.